Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 27. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 27. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 27. And I did pray with a woman heart about, hey, this is our first time gathering together. And uh, the church, you know what a church is in the Bible? It's ecclesia. That means it's a called out assembly. You say, what are we doing? We're assembling together. The church is not this building. The church is you. If you're saved and you know the Lord Jesus Christ, you're in the body. And here we are together, meeting together as a church. Amen? You say, we don't have a name yet. Well, we'll work on all those things, okay? And pray about it and, uh, and do that. But we'll, we'll pray in the meantime. And so as I begin to pray, I, I thought, Lord, what do you want me to preach on this morning? What we have to say? And so I thought um, the, the, the Lord gave me the message uh, to preach this morning. What makes a good Bible-believing church? Amen? And that's what we need to know. Amen? What, 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 what makes a good Bible-believing church? In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 27, the Bible says that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. And let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer, and we'll pray. Uh, Lord Jesus, we come to you now. We thank you, Lord, so much for the time you've given us together. We thank you for providing this hall. We thank you for bringing us all together, Lord, to worship you in spirit and in truth. And we pray that the living words of the living God would go forth with power and strength, and God, that you would speak to hearts this morning. We ask these things and ask the blessing on your word. Now, Lord, I ask you, God, to help me be able to preach as a dying man to dying men, never sure to preach again. This may be the last message that we all hear uh, before your return. And I do pray for your soon return, that uh, it could even be today during this message. That'd be just fine with me, Lord, that you come back even before we finish praying. But Lord, I do pray for anybody here this morning. I don't know everybody's testimony. And with a crowd this size, there might be somebody here that's never trusted the Lord Jesus Christ. As for their soul's salvation, they never trust in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, put their faith in Him. And Lord, I pray this morning that they would get saved before it's everlasting too late. I pray you bless your word and bless your people now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Uh, as Bible believers, we need to know what a Bible believing church is. Amen. Uh, what it looks like. So we can sincerely work together uh, with God's help in building and establishing a local church that pleases Him. Amen. And you're a group together shown that interest. And so uh, I thought, what better thing to be fitting? Amen. Uh, the first thing I'd like to say in this message, and I've got several several things I'd like to say, but the first thing is uh, when you when we establish and we, we, we're wanting a good Bible in the church, that we want the Bible in its right place. First thing, we want the Bible in its right place. Amen. So the first thing I'd like to say under that heading is the Bible is actually believed and taught as the words of God. Amen. Uh, you're in Ephesians. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. 1 Thessalonians. That's just to your right a little bit in your Bible. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. And look down at verse number 13. 1 Thessalonians 2 verse 13. The Bible says, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God which effectually worketh also in you that believe. Amen? You want the Word of God being taught and being believed as the, the, literally the words of God. Amen? And that's simpler than some people think. And, um, uh, you know, we want a, um, a Bible. The Bible says there, it's not as the Word of men, but as it is the truth, the Word of God, and the Word of God effectually, it affects you. Amen? It changes your life. When you believe this Bible, and when you have put it into use, it affects you, it changes you, amen, and does a work in you that believe. Um, we not only believe just the generic form of the word Bible, we believe the King James Bible, amen. We believe that uh, as Bible believers, we believe that uh, God preserved his word in the King James Bible, that it's perfect, that it's inspired and preserved, amen. And uh, Psalm chapter 12, uh, if you want to turn there, Psalm chapter 12, mm -hmm. and verse 6, and uh, we'll look there, Psalm chapter 12, right in the middle of your Bible, Psalm chapter 12, and the Bible says there, in Psalm chapter 12, and verse number 6, Psalm 12, 6. I 
I like to hear those pages turn. Can I see what I see then? Psalm chapter 12, verse 6. The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in the furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. <coughs> Amen. Amen. So we don't believe we don't believe that the King James is just the best translation. We believe that God inspired his words and that he preserved them all the way for us today as he promised. If we don't commit the keeping of the Bible to men, we can commit it to God because God said he would preserve it, and he has. He would inspire it, and he did, and preserve it. We have it in our hands today, amen? And so we, and we as Bible believers, and, and having a Bible-believing church, we know the Bible is in its right place, amen? Uh, so if the King James Bible is, is believed to be the actual words of God, and we are, we believe that, and it's going to be preached and taught as it is in truth, the living words of God. A modernist, and somebody that's modern in their beliefs and false teaching, does not believe that he has the Bible. And so uh, he gets a modern translation and, and a false translation, or any translation for that matter, and he believes that it's the Word of God. And there's many things wrong with that, but uh, he may believe and, and teach you when you go to these places that, oh, in the original autographs, that, but they wax eloquent, the original autographs. <laughs> and uh, they haven't seen those in 2,000 years, but they still hung up on them. Um, but they're all gone. They've disappeared and nobody's seen any. And so, um, consequently, he can't even preach what he believes to be the Word of God. And so he has no Bible to look to and to have, and, and he doesn't have anything. And so he's expecting you to believe something he doesn't even believe he has. All messed up. But as a Bible believer, we believe that we've got the Word of God. Amen. And we don't believe it's in the Greek or the Hebrew. We've got it in English for us preserved for today in the King James Bible. Amen. And now, now we want a preacher, and you do want a preacher that believes the book. Amen. And that's what you're after. That's what you, you and knows that this Bible is the authority. Amen. And so uh, back from Psalms, look at 2 Timothy uh, chapter 4. Uh, in a Bible believing church, you want preaching, uh, not just teaching. Uh, you, you find modern churches, and what you find in there is they are teaching, 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 teaching. No, teaching is dead. Um, 2 Timothy chapter 4, 2 Timothy chapter 4, and verse number 3. You need in preaching, somebody's going to cut you. You know what sermon means? Sermon is a Latin word that means to stab or to thrust. You say, why? The Bible says in, in Psalm chapter 149, verse number 6, it says, Let the high praises of God be in their mouth and a two edged sword in their hand. And it says, uh, Cursed is he that holdeth back his sword from blood. And you say, what happens? In uh, the Old Testament, uh, uh, the fellow there put the sword in and the dirt came out of that, that old fat king. And you say, what do you need? You need a preacher that's going to preach to you, not just get up and tickle your ears and teach, teach, teach. There's a time for teaching. Don't get me wrong. There ought to be a time, but there's also a time for preaching. And most of the men or women nowadays, it's in the pulpit, uh, unfortunately, uh, you say, what do they do? They get up and they talk and they're soft and they're nice, but they won't say, thus saith the Lord. Right? And get your attention and preach. And you need a preacher. The Bible says uh, in the last days in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, I charge thee therefore before God, Paul's charging this preacher, and the Lord Jesus Christ who shall judge the, pre the, the quick and the dead that is appearing in his kingdom. What did he say? Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, negative. Rebuke, negative. Exhort, positive. So you say, what do you want? You want preaching that's sometimes negative. The Bible, if you've got a Bible-believing church, you're going to have a Bible-believing preaching that's going to be negative towards sin, negative towards the world, and negative to, towards the flesh, and he's going to preach on it. Amen. Amen. Amen? And then he's going to exhort you to get it right, repent, and get it under the blood and go on for God. Amen? Amen. And you want that. And you keep reading. And exhort with all long-suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust, shall they heap to themselves what? To teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and be turned unto fables. And so, what you have today is you have preachers, of so called, standing in the pulpit, and they're not preaching, they're just teaching, teaching, teaching. 
But there's sometimes where the preacher needs to get up and rear back and let you have it. Amen. Bob Jones, a uh, um, uh, um, uh, senior, used to say, he said, I like a preacher that makes me feel mean. He said, I like to go home and feel like a dog sometimes. <laughs> you know, he said, every sin uh, that I'm committing. Amen. I like that. You need a church not only that's preaching, uh, not just teaching, but you need a church where the Bible is being glorified and exalted. Now look at 2 Thessalonians. You said, that sounds like heresy. Well, let's bear with me. Let's read the Bible, okay? Uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. Let's see what God says about it. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 1. The Bible says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 1, Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free course and be what? Glorified. Glorified. Wow. You mean you're supposed to take that book and say, Glory to God Amen. for giving us a Bible, amen, that we can trust and we can handle. Our hands have handled the word of life. We've touched it, we've felt it, we've seen it. We believe the Bible, amen. It can be glorified and exalted. The Bible says there that in a free course and be glorified even as it is with you. You know what Bible believers do? They glorify the word of God. Amen. You know how many times I've heard, well, you, you, you make that Bible into an idol. That's a false god to you. I'm like, you're crazy, man. These people out there, they, they think that, now that Bible taught me about my sin and taught me about my Savior. Taught me about the world, the flesh, and the devil. Taught me everything that I know. I owe it my soul salvation. I owe it to this Word of God that taught me about Jesus and how to get to Jesus. It ought to be glorified and exalted. You say, why should it be exalted? God exalted. I look at Psalm chapter 138, right in the middle of your Bible. Psalm chapter 138. Psalm 138 and verse number 2. We'll look at verse 1 first. In Psalm 138 and verse 1. The Bible says, Psalm 138 verse 1. 138. I will praise thee with my whole heart. Before the gods will I sing praise unto thee. I will worship toward thy holy temple. And praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth. For thou hast magnified thy what? Word above all thy name. So you say, what, uh, what, what do we do in the Bible believing church? We exalt and glorify the word of God. Because God does. In God's word, uh, from his preacher, the apostle Paul said, they did the same thing. And so it's not, it's not something we should be ashamed of because we're Bible believers and we believe the truth and we believe that book. Amen. Take Amen. a bold stand for Jesus Christ. Amen. You say, why? There's people out there that are in darkness. And I'm not talking about the lost. I'm talking about saved. They're in churches where they get salvation preached to them every week, but they don't ever hear any of the doctrines from the Word of God because the, 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 the teaching is there and it is a kilometer wide and just centimeters deep. Amen. And they don't have any depth of earth. They have no depth in their doctrine and their teaching because it's all they all get up and they, everybody's, you're okay, I'm okay. Da, 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 da. Hey! <laughs> we got Joe Osteen. <laughs> they had a shooting at his church and he gets on the news afterwards and he's smiling about it. He, I think it's plastered on, he can't even turn it off. It's like his face is... They always told me when I was a kid, you make that face and the wind blows, your, your face is going to freeze that way. You know, I think that's what happened to him. His face froze that way. That fellow, I tell you. The second thing that you want to look for and, and have in a Bible believing church, and what makes a good Bible believing church is all the doctrines of Jesus Christ are taught. All the doctrines. Look at Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Acts. Fifth book of your Bible in the New Testament. Acts chapter 20 and verse 20. The Bible believing church, a good Bible believing church, all the doctrines of Jesus Christ are taught. Not just the ones that are popular, not just the ones that are, are, are uh, the, you know, the nice ones. All of them. Acts chapter 20 and verse 20. Amen. And uh, this is where you get, I don't know if they, they use this terminology in Australia, but Acts, you got 2020 vision. That's yeah. what you got to have. You got to have the right vision here. 2020, Acts 2020. 
And so Acts chapter 20 and verse 20, the apostle Paul says to the church and, and preaching, he says, and how I kept back what? Nothing. Nothing that was profitable unto you, but I've showed you and I've taught you publicly and from house to house. Because I went to your house and taught you, I've taught you in public, preaching the truth and teaching the truth. Look on down at verse 27. For I have not what? Shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of who? God. Say, what's God's counsel? It's right there. You want a Bible, a good Bible believing church is going to preach all the whole counsel of God, and He's going to not hold back anything from you. If the preacher's up there preaching or somebody teaching in that church, you want a Bible believer that's up there teaching and preaching that's going to tell you the whole counsel of God. Amen. Not hold anything back. I guarantee you, these churches that are out there, you say, what are they doing? They're holding back. They're not learning it themselves, but they know that they preach the truth and straightforward after congregation way. Yeah. Listen, when a preacher, a Bible believing preacher, stands in the pulpit and stands before a group and preaches the truth, he doesn't take into consideration man. His dealings is with God. Amen. And God says, preach it and to do something, and he delivers the word of God. He said, I've not shunned to declare to you all the counsel of God. Yeah. He didn't tickle their ears. He didn't make them feel good about their sin and what they were in. He said, this is wrong. This is right. This is what God says about it. He preached the whole counsel of God. That's what you want in a good Bible-believing church. A preacher, a teacher that's going to teach the whole counsel of God. And like I said before, not, a, not in churches, not been in them before. And thank God for them in the sense that they are preaching the gospel and they use the King James. I thank God for that, okay? Um, the, the book of Philippians says, the Apostle Paul says, I rejoice that whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached. And he said, I will rejoice. So I thank God for that. But it grieves my heart that it's so watered down in their doctrine and their belief and they don't grow. And you say, what happens? Those churches, a lot of times, it's like a revolving door. They go right in and they come right out because why? They're starving. They're not getting fed the doctrine. They're not getting preached to. And they think the problem's with them. And it grieves me. You say, why are you down here preaching? Because it grieves me. I want a Bible-believing presence in, in Melbourne, amen? I want to see a Bible-believing presence in every everywhere in Australia, every town, and, and have the truth preached and have those ones that get saved have a Bible-believing church to go to, amen? amen. And... Um, you say, what do you mean? You need a church that's going to preach the whole council and the right doctrine, um, and, and you need a preach the church that's going to preach about heaven. Amen. And preach about heaven. Amen. You say, why? Because sinners are still going to hell. Amen. And they need to hear about hell. They need to hear about the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Uh, there, there's, there need to be hearing about how the Lord Jesus is to be loved, how he's to be feared, how the Lord's supposed to be obeyed, and how he's supposed to be served, amen, and he's worthy, how he's supposed to be lifted up, how he's supposed to be honored and cherished, he's supposed to be preached, we're to fellowship with him, we're supposed to rely on him, we're supposed to be strengthened by his grace, we're supposed to be cleansed by his blood and sanctified by his presence, encouraged by his promises, amen, that's what we need. We're supposed to be taught about rightly dividing the word of truth in those doctrines. You say, why? It's the key that unlocks the door to the Bible and understanding. And once you understand that, you're, you're, that's where that depth comes from in doctrine and understanding. I don't know about you, but when I, before I learned about rightly dividing for several years, I would beat, it was like beating my head against that brick wall. I would read there in the Bible, it just wouldn't make sense to me. I said, I don't understand it. How can I, how can this be? And I would deal with cults and I would deal with false teachers and they would show me the verses and I believe the Bible. I believe the verse I read in the Bible, but the way they were applying it, I knew it wasn't right, but I didn't have the answer. And God, I prayed, and God gave me the answer. In right to right, Bible believing, preaching and teaching. And obviously God's done that for many of you and shown you the same thing. Amen. Amen. A good Bible believing church also has, the next thing I like to say is, the Holy Spirit has liberty in that church. Amen. The Holy Spirit has liberty. And uh, 2 Corinthians, you don't have to turn there. You can write it down 3 and verse 17. says, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Yeah. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. In the church, the Spirit of the Lord is the one who gives the spiritual gifts to the body. And he's the teacher. 
The Holy Spirit is the revealer of truth. He's the source of power. He's the, uh, he's the giver of fruit. The Bible says in the book of John that the Holy Spirit testifies of Jesus Christ. He intercedes for the saints. He glorifies God. He glorifies Jesus Christ. He unifies the body. He convicts the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment, the Bible says. And he doesn't magnify himself. The Holy Spirit doesn't. You know the surefire way that you know that the, where the Spirit of the Lord is and the Holy Spirit's working in the church? You won't hear about the Holy Ghost and the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the Holy, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit. Because when He's working, the Bible says He doesn't testify of Himself, but He testifies of Jesus Christ. When you see Jesus Christ being lifted up, you say, the Holy Spirit's working in that church. But if you go to a church where it's Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost in this, Holy Spirit, Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost you can guarantee that that's not the right one. Because the Holy Spirit's not behind that. He doesn't testify to himself, the Bible says in the book of John. He testifies to Jesus. He glorifies Jesus. He lifts up that name. Amen? Amen. He never magnifies himself, the Holy Spirit, his gifts above the Word of God or the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's not all um, with the, the Spirit of the Lord, but that's just a, an idea. That's something that, that you need to have. And, and boy, you're talking about being a Bible-believing church where the Spirit of the Lord is there and having liberty is something else. And, um, and so keep that in mind, amen? amen. And so um, a good question asked by a preacher many years ago was, what, what, and he asked somebody else this, he said, what in the church would stop if the Holy Spirit pulled out? He asked the pastor this. The pastor answered uh, to his chart and, and, and to his you know, annoyance, the pastor asked the answer and said, not much would change if the Holy Spirit pulled out. In the church, in a good church, Bible believing church, the Holy Spirit has absolute liberty. And you say, what does that mean? Sometimes that means that uh, sometimes church service can become ritualistic. You know, if you've been in religious places before, it's it's up and down. They'll even put out, you know, uh, a schedule of events and they'll go, go to the They'll, they'll almost, um, to the minute, be on that schedule. I'm not of that persuasion. Uh, I, I'm, uh, sometimes the Lord may, may stop in the middle of the service and say, hey, let's have an invitation where you can pray and get right with the Lord. We'll pick back up and start preaching. There may be times where we just leave the singing out altogether, or we may sing a little longer, and somebody may sing a special, do something like that. Hey, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. Amen. Amen. Get a chance to testify and glorify God. Praise be to the Lord. I've been in these churches, man, where it's up and down, up and down, and, and then you just turn around like a robot and you walk out and you go home. There's no liberty there. There's no liberty in the Lord. And, and you know, we're, we're laughing, we're carrying on, and you know, and you know what's okay? It's okay to, to laugh and to enjoy the service and have a, have a good fellowship with one another and thank God for it. Yeah. Some, some churches get so so tight that they can't even laugh. I, 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 even the Baptists, when I came to Australia, there was a group, There's uh, they had the National Baptist Fellowship, they call it. And some guy came and he was excited and he'd been saved for a while. And he was saying, amen, Lord. And he was thanking God for the preaching. He was saying, amen, and getting excited. And guess what? Here come two stuffed shirts back there. You, you need to stop saying amen. You you're disrupting the service. Oh, and cold, cold water on it is. You know what the Bible says? Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. You know what's a biblical word? When you agree with something to preach, you say amen. amen. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Thanks be to God. And uh, they, they said, no, oh, you got to block it down. You can't say that here. Well, that, that's, the, that's testifying. The Holy Spirit wasn't there. Amen. And so the next thing you're in the book of Acts, look over to Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 21. You, a Bible believing church, Galatians, Ephesians chapter 3. A Bible believing church, you say, what is it? I'm a good one. In the Bible believing church, God gets glory in the church. Ephesians chapter 3, Galatians, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 21. 
The Bible says, unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. 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 So unto him uh, uh, in the church, you say, what kind of what is in a Bible believing church? A Bible believing church, Jesus Christ and God the Father have the preeminence yeah. and glory is given to them. Yeah. Amen? Mm -hmm. Not on the preacher, not on the congregation, not on the song service, but to Jesus Christ. Yeah. Not unto men, but to Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. The Bible talks about over uh, towards the end of the Bible there, there's a fellow there that loveth to have the preeminence. Mm -hmm. Diotrephes. He loveth to have the preeminence. And you say, what happened? He, he wouldn't allow anybody to come into the church that would steal a bit of his glory. He even put them out of the church. When they questioned it, he put them out of the church and forbid them for coming. And John the Beloved wrote to him and said, uh, you know, that he loved to have the preeminence. But the Bible says that God is supposed to have the preeminence. He's supposed to get the glory, amen? And um, the number one objective of a local church should be to glorify God. And of course, this needs to be properly balanced with edification of the saints and the evangelization of uh, the uh, evangelization of sinners, and we evangelize the lost. Nevertheless, a church can concentrate on its mission uh, so much um, and get off course so much that it forgets what was put there. And you say, "What do you mean by that?" I've been in churches that they push programs so much. That, oh, we're going to go door knocking, we're going to go letterboxing, we're going to go preaching on the street. That it becomes just work, 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 work. And it's not a time of worship and fellowship with Jesus Christ yeah. where he gets the glory. It almost gets to where when you come into a church, it's a drudge. And it's just, oh. yeah. <laughs> and And it, it become, can become that way. But in a Bible-believing church, it ought to be rightly balanced. Amen. Rightly balanced with those things. Amen? Amen? That's what you want. And so, so that Jesus Christ has the preeminence and gets the glory. Amen. Revelation chapter 4 verse 11 tells us, While we're placed here on earth, whether in the church or whether uh, just as an individual Christian in the body, and the Bible says in Revelation chapter 4 and verse 11, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive... Glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Amen. 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 That ought to, some people say, well, why am I placed here on earth? You could be in a hospital bed and may not be able to make it to church, or letterbox, or preach on the street, or pass out a track, but you can lay in that bed and bring pleasure to Jesus Christ yeah. and mm -hmm. glorify Him. No matter where you're at in life, what you're doing, you can be a little child and bring him pleasure. Yeah. You can be at any stage of your life, be older, be younger, you can please him by fellowshipping and worshiping him and, and spending time with him. You can do those things. And you can please him. See, I used to think the only thing that pleased the Lord was this and this and this and a list of works to do. Uh, you know, not for salvation, but after you get saved, this is pleasing the Lord, that's pleasing the Lord. Not so. You say, the Bible said he created us for his pleasure. You know, my kids don't have to work to uh, work and do all this work to please me. My, my little five-year-old daughter, she crawls up in my lap and she'll put both hands on my beard and she'll start loving my face. <laughs> I'm hugging her hands. What do you mean? I'm getting the credit card out. What do you mean? What do you want? And she's she, and you know, she's just close to my heart. I, I can, my heart can be racing and almost have a palpitation, stressed out from the anxieties of the world and things going on. She can crawl up and just get close to me. Man, I'm calm. <laughs> and that pleases me. That makes me happy. And you know what? I'm her world. I'm daddy, and she loves me, and, and, and I'm the apple of her eye. Amen. You know what? That's the same way with the Lord. Yeah. Yeah. You fellowship with the Lord, you crawl up in his lap, you talk to him, you're interested in him. Father, what do you want me to do today? What pleases you? Yeah. You're talking about the Lord. Man, mm. there's fellowship there. You can please him sitting in your lounge room by your bedside. And you don't have to do all these works and be on the street and let it go. All those things are fine, balance the Christian life. But you know why the Lord um, created you? Because he wanted to fellowship with you. Yeah. <laughs> Fellowship was broken in Adam, and here comes Jesus Christ. He sent his only begotten son so that fellowship could be restored. Amen. 
He created us because He loves us and He wants to fellowship and bring some glory and pleasure. Amen. Amen. In a Bible believing, moving on, um, the Bible believing church, the saints should have compassion for the lost. In uh, your Revelation, look at the first book of the New Testament, Matthew chapter number 9, and verse 36. Matthew chapter 9, and verse 36. Need a compassion for the lost. Uh, the saints do in the church. Matthew chapter 9 and verse 36. If you ever go to a church that's not soul conscious, that's not interested in the souls of men, then you're in the wrong church. You're not, uh, you're not, um, um, you're not the place uh, of the right Bible believing church. You know what happens? When you start, stop going out, when you stop trying to reach the walls, you turn inward. And guess what happens to a church when they do that? They start not tearing each other apart. I've seen it before. You say, why? We're supposed to be together in fellowship, and then we're supposed to go out. The Bible says the, that a church is supposed to be a place of training so that you can go do, the saints can go do the work of the ministry. But some people make the whole Christian life about church only. They're only Christian on Sunday. They only worship on Sunday. They lay their Bible aside, and they don't pick it up until next Sunday when they go to church. Christian life is every day. <laughs> Every waking moment, every breath you take, every heartbeat that you have is the Christian life, yeah. is walking in fellowship with Jesus Christ. Yeah. But the saints have a compassion for the lost. Matthew chapter 9 and verse 36 tells us that Jesus Christ himself, 9 and verse 36, it says, But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them, because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Mm -hmm. This is the only prayer request the Lord ever had in the Bible. And it, it, that, that, that you read about. You say, what was it that Jesus had? Then saith he to his disciples, the harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye the, therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. So the Lord is concerned about the souls of men. He died for them, amen? amen. He has compassion for the lost. You ought to have compassion for the lost. You ought, a Bible-believing church, the next thing I like to say, is a church that gives to missions. Look at Acts chapter 13. Uh, Acts 13. And that is tied up with the Great Commission. Acts chapter 13. Our church in Sydney, uh, we, the Lord helped us last year. We gave about $152,000 to missions. And uh, God helped us last year. $152,000 of about 23 different missionaries. Yeah. And uh, we didn't get there overnight. It took uh, over 10 years for us to work and start giving to that end. And uh, of course, it helped us. We sent a man uh, out of our church, Bible-believing preacher, to the to uh, the Philippines. He's been there now for a couple of years. We, we sent two other men out to plant churches, one in Oladola, one on the Gold Coast uh, in, uh, in, in uh, Queensland. So if you're ever in the uh, Gold Coast, you can go by and see Believers Baptist Church up there. Brother Danny Weiss and his family, his family is up there. Brother Rodney is in uh, Oladola, New South Wales, three hours south of Sydney. So if you're traveling those places, you can go to a Bible-believing church. Amen? And so uh, we, we sent those men out. But this is you see, those men, we send them out on a mission. You say, what? On a mission to plant a church? Uh, on a mission to preach the gospel? The, mission, the word mission is not in the Bible as, as far as uh, that goes, but they're on a mission. They're sent out by the Holy Ghost and from their local church. And that's where they get the term missionary, where we plant churches, we send them out. And that's, that's what we do. That's what this is. This is a, a mission work out of our local church where we're, it, it costs money to come down here. It costs money to buy tracks. It costs money to... Um, to, to, to rent a hall cost money to do those things. And you say, why can I come do this? Because our church gave so that a church could be planted and a church would go forward. Amen? Amen. And get involved um, in the work of missions. I think when I was at Bible Baptist in Pensacola, Dr. Ruffman's church, we were there uh, in November, uh, and 80% of their income, I believe they said, 80% of the income of the church goes to missions mm -hmm. and missionaries. And, uh, and so they have, I, I wanted to say at one time, they had over 100 missionaries sent out of their church. And uh, we've got one out of, we've got three out of Sydney. And so we're, we're, fault, we're not as, as far along as they are, but man, we're trying. Amen? Amen. And, uh, and so you want a church that gives to missions. Acts 13 and verse 2. And the Bible says there in Acts chapter 13 and verse 2. And as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I have called them. 
When they fasted and prayed, laid their hands on them, they sent them away. So they being sent forth by the what? Holy Ghost. Well, the Holy Ghost. They were sent on a mission to preach the gospel, to plant churches. And that's our commission. And, and uh, you say, there's some of there's some that, sister, before you go, can I get you to come up here real quick? Let's pause the message just real quick. I wanted to share with you, this is Sophia. And Sophia, Wednesday night after our Bible study, I opened the Bible and I showed Sophia how to be saved. And what happened to you, Sophia? So she's got to take off, she's got to work, but she wanted to come out to the church today. And uh, but all God's people said, Amen. God bless you. She wants you to go to work. Thank you for coming. So praise the Lord for Sister Sophia. Amen. Thank you. So God be the glory. Amen. So, so, um, but yeah, Wednesday night after we met together and uh, did our, our Bible study at Sister Annette's house, uh, she, I met her on the, on the bonnet of my, my car and opened the Bible from the street light, opened the scriptures, and she trusted the Lord Jesus Christ. And I said, I said, now that is a, a good, a good uh, indication from the Lord. The Lord wants something here. Amen. <laughs> Soul got saved the first meeting we had. And so, we got some gospel tracks out today, so some folks there that uh, need, the, need the gospel as well. So keep praying, amen. We want souls to be saved. So you want a church that's involved in missions? Uh, Colossians chapter 3, from the book of Acts, turn to your right. Colossians chapter 3. And I'm just about finished. I won't uh, go uh, too much longer here. Two more points here. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 16. The Bible says, Colossians 3, 16. You want a church, a Bible-believing church? The music is spiritual and God honoring. The music is spiritual and God honoring. Not a rock and roll concert. Not smoke and mirrors and steam coming out of this side like it's you know professional wrestling and, and uh, football you know running out of the field and, and all the, the flashing lights going everywhere. That's not God's not in that. God's far away from that. That's the world's way of entertainment. When you stand up for God and you sing, or we sing, sing hymns this morning, say, so what is it? The Bible tells us here, Colossians chapter 3 and verse 16, it says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another. How? In psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. See, when you sang this morning, we sang to the Lord. Yeah. Someone gets up here and they sing a special, they're not doing it for the congregation. Mm -hmm. They're singing to the Lord. Mm -hmm. See, some people get up here and they're entertaining. Mm -hmm. We don't get up to entertain. Mm -hmm. So when I teach our church that when somebody sings and does a good job, and maybe they play an instrument, they sing, I, I teach our church, we don't do this. You say, why? Because we're not praising the individual. Mm -hmm. We're not, you say, what, is, what do we say? Glory to God, hallelujah, amen. That was a blessing. We praise God yeah. because their ministry, they're singing to the Lord. You're getting a blessing out of it. They're not entertaining you. They're edifying you. Yes. Building you up, encouraging you. That's what you want in a Bible-believing church. None of this funny business like the world does. Amen. You want spiritual and God-honoring music. And so those uh, categories of songs for the church, is mentioned there. Psalms, you know what that is. You got a whole you know what that word means, Psalms? It's Psalms. And so we got 150 chapters there. And you can sing those. Then you've got hymns. You know what hymn hymns is? It's about him. We got hymn books that's got 500 songs in it. That's got about 12. Every song in there is about him. Amen. Amen. I know it's spelled different, but it's about him. Amen. And um, and then the, the third one is spiritual songs. Here's where some people go off the rails. And if you've got a background in the, the churches that are modern day churches, Pentecostal churches, those things, you probably have a background of contemporary Christian music, they call it. It's not any more uh, Christian than a bottle of grog. And drugs. Okay, you can take grog and you can rip the label off and put Christian grog. Does that make it Christian? No. It's still grog. You can take the world's music and relabel it and call it something else, but it's still that. It's still from this world. It's earthly, sensual, and devilish. Amen? 
And so you, you, you say the things of the Lord are pure, easy to be entreated. They're right. They're clean. They're holy. And so the, the stuff where, um, where you've got the, the drums playing and the <clears throat> the Bible says that's the sound of war. When Moses came down from the mount and it's got the drums going, it's got that music, he said, is that the sound of war I hear in the camp? And they said, no, that's where the children of Israel were worshiping a false god. They got the drums going and the music going. Nebuchadnezzar, the, all this music going and the drums were going as well. And all of that uh, stuff was happening with Nebuchadnezzar, and they were worshiping a false god. So you better watch it. The Bible says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. They twisted that in the modern so called churches, and you don't want that. So, Bible believing church, the music is spiritual and God honoring. And the singing teaches you and sets your heart to receive the preaching of the word of God so it'll stay with you. Spiritual music will do that for you, carnal, sensual music won't. Dr. Ruffin illustrated it this way. He said, when, you, when you've got uh, hymns and you've got the right singing, it's march music. We're marching to Zion, beautiful, beautiful Zion. We're marching upward to Zion, the beautiful city of God. Mm -hmm. It's march uh, music. It's, that, it's the timing is right. It's laid out right. It's pure. He said, but when you get this world's music, you get those offbeats, you get all that stuff. And he said, when he said, when it moves from the foot to the hips and starts moving, you got a problem. <laughs> That's flesh. That's the way to illustrate it. It makes sense. And so you gotta watch that. Bible believing church. The last thing I like to say is very important. Uh, John chapter 15 and verse 12. And we'll finish this morning. John chapter 15, thank you for uh, listening Sorry. so attentively attend this morning. John chapter 15, verse 12. The last thing I'd like to say is the saints love each other in a Bible believing church. And you ought to more so than anywhere else in the world. This ought to be a place, the Bible says, God is love. Yeah. And it ought to be a place, the Bible believing church ought to be a place that's filled with love, grace, uh, of the Lord. Amen. There ought to be, and, and listen, if somebody ever comes into our assembly and they're, man, they've got, uh, you know, they've got their tank top on and tattoos. Last week in our church on Sunday morning, a man came forward. He's from, I think he's from Melbourne, and he was in, he's moved to Sydney. Uh, his name's Micah. He came forward after the service and, and had a tattoo all down his face, onto his neck. And he came forward with tears in his eyes to receive the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 I got the room to Christ and tell you about the love of God. Yeah. And we ought to be a place that, that can come in here from the world and be marred by sin. Yeah. And like the woman at the well that came to Jesus yeah. and those other ones, when they come in here, they ought to know that Christians are not going to despise them. Yeah. I've heard of some churches that have. Yeah. No, that's not the time for that. We ought to love sinners yeah. when they come. You say, why? You were a sinner at one time. You had to come and get in and find out about the Lord Jesus Christ to get saved. You ought to be filled with love for one another and for the sinners that come. And then John chapter 15 and verse number 12, the Bible says this. John 15 and verse 12. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. The Bible says we love him because he first loved us. And it says, greater love hath no man than this, that a man may down his life for his friends. We sing the song, blessed be the tie that binds our hearts together in Christian love. And we ought to uh, exalt that and know that. In the Bible, uh, in the book of First John, in question, that they told a man, he said, how can a man love God if he doesn't even love his brother? Mm -hmm. And you ought, to, you ought to love your brothers and sisters in Christ. Amen? And... Um, I'll also say this, uh, to love one another, there, there are churches that, um, that, that, that don't love each other. And you say, how do they show the opposite of that? Because church, people in church, you say, what are they doing? They're, they're gossiping, they're, they, they've got disguised hatred, evil speaking, and malice, and disgust. And if the folks in the church are having trouble loving each other, then they're going to have a tough time loving God. So if you don't love each other, you're not going to be able to love God. And some people say, I love God. I don't like this one. I don't like that one. <laughs> I love this one. 
There's something wrong with how you love your God. Amen? Amen. And so, listen, there's something, to be honest with you, we're probably not going to rub each other the right way. You know what a church is and an assembly is? It's sinners bumping against each other. With all our problems and faults and baggage, you know what? We bump into each other. We say things that we don't agree with each other in personal life, but we agree on the book. Amen. And we agree that we're sinners in need of uh, edification from the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We agree on a lot, we, but the things, we'll t take a half a dozen things we disagree on, and we'll break fellowship, and we'll not like one another. It's not a good way to be. Amen. God help us. And so, um, the last thing is, um, with one another, we need to have grace, and we need to learn to have grace-filled um, words and understandings with each other. Uh, Galatians chapter 6 and verse 1, the Bible says, Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. And in John chapter here, John 15, look over at John 13 and verse 35, and we'll finish. John chapter 13 and verse 35. John chapter 13 and verse 35. The Bible says, John 13 and verse 35. And back up to verse 34. The new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another, as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. Because of that, by this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. <laughs> Amen. 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 So if you have a church based on these biblical principles, you'll have a good Bible believing church. Mm -hmm. And there's a hundred other things I could say, but that's just um, you know, the backbone, the skeleton of things that we can consider. And, uh, um, you know, sad thing is, is old Billy Graham used to come and he'd have his crusades and some people would get saved. And he and his ministry afterwards would tell them, said, and he would make this say, go to the church of your choice. No, that's not the right advice after someone gets saved. Don't go to the church of your choice. Go to the church, that's nonsense. As Bible believers, we don't go to the church of our choice. We go to the church of God's choice. And what God says is a church, a Bible-believing church. And so I encourage you, now that you're having some understanding that, pray about these things. Amen? Amen. Consider them. And uh, I'll say in closing, if you're here today and you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, and maybe you have some doubts about whether or not you're going to heaven when you die, I'd like, I, I can be happy to stick around as long as it takes. We'll open a Bible. We'll show you what it takes to know for sure what it takes for you to go to heaven when you die. And that's simple. In the, the, the Bible calls the gospel in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 to 4, how that Christ died on the cross for your sins, was buried, and on the third day rose again. Yeah. And if you'll put your faith and trust in Him, He'll save you. I got saved at 15 years old. I'm from four generations of murderers. Some of you are getting scared now. <laughs> four generations of murderers, moonshiners, cutthroats. Uh, I've seen I've seen things growing up no child should ever see. And I grew up around that. Thanks be to God, he, he protected me, put me in a bubble, brought me, never tasted alcohol, never smoked a cigarette, never had any drugs. Although my whole family, my brothers, they, they all had that. God put me in a bubble and I got saved at 15. I got called to preach at 17. But I got saved at 15 after my best friend took his own life. And I wondered every day for a fortnight where I was going to spend eternity in what it takes to get to heaven. And I'm thankful. I went to church and heard the gospel. And Jesus Christ said, come unto me, all you that labor, and heavy labor, and I'll give you rest. And I went to it, and I found rest for my soul. Amen. And I'm like, for you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, get saved today. I'll show you from the Bible how to do that. Let's be dismissed with a word of prayer. And that's a blessing on the service. Thank you, Lord, for the good hand of the Lord upon this service. Lord, I feel your spirit, your presence in this place. Thank you, God, for opening doors. Thank you for providing this hall for us. Thank you for Sophia getting saved and trusting the Lord Jesus Christ. What a joy. I pray, God, that we see your hand and feel your hand in everything that's done and said here in Melbourne. And, God, you'll continue to bless and open doors and bring together those ones that are truly searching for a Bible-believing church so they can grow in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. We love you and praise you and ask you to be with each and every saint as they go on their way uh, and as they travel home this morning. In Jesus' precious name, we pray and give thanks. Amen. 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 Amen.